the Beers Association. Sure. Let's uh, let's pick up on the pool idea on this one. Uh, both concerned clergy and uh, and homeowners association. I'm sorry, neighbors association. Now we changed our names. Uh, support the idea of a, of a pool uh, at the community center. When I say a pool, you know, specifically we're talking about um, a small neighborhood pool for the kids. You know, for handicapped folks, for seniors, uh, that type of thing. With maybe with some private events to help defray the cost. The question that I have for you is, is specific. Do you support the construction of a community pool, even if we have to subsidize some of the operating costs with tax revenue? And we'll start with a minute to Mr. Stoddard. Well, there, there's a number of residents who differ on this, and ultimately I have to support uh, what the residents want to do. Some say not a penny. I've heard those. Some say a reasonable amount. I, as a resident, would be willing to support it. If somebody else were making the decision and they asked me how much would you pay, I said, I think it's worth something to the community to do that. Um, I do have to respect uh, what the rest of the commission does, and uh, sorry, what the rest of the residents feel. But I don't think we're there. I think we have an operator who's willing to operate this on a break-even basis. And the interesting opportunity, and Sean has mentioned this to me twice, that the business community might be willing to chip in as much as 250K to subsidize the operation so that we could provide scholarships for the less affluent kids in our community to be able to use the pool and it still wouldn't cost the residents a dime. Mr. Obina. Thank you. Let me, let me be very clear. They keep claiming that, uh, that it's going to have to be subsidized, not if you create these partnerships. And by the way, you know, there's something that needs to be done here. They still need to continue to go after state and federal dollars for programs. But let me put it to you this way. That was a promise that should have been taken care of a long time ago. Money, that CAA, we may lose. And we cannot afford to lose dollars in this community. This is a small city. That was a promise. And I want a real pool. I don't want some little modified pool. I want something that everybody can use. The children, the seniors, everyone in this community. Hey, and somebody talked about water polo programs. Create it, they will come. But let's stop saying that it needs to be subsidized. Let's be honest. There's people currently on this dais that don't want to see that pool built because it's being built on the wrong side of the highway. That's a God's honest truth. It needs to be done. Believe me, people here will travel to a good pool if it's built, pro built properly, and it will not need to be subsidized. I want to make that clear to the taxpayers in South Miami. Uh, uh, moderator's discretion, I'm going to ask a follow-up on the pool from the, uh, the audience questions since we're on the subject right now. Uh, last week, the pool contract was first read. The city manager and city attorney advised the commission they would not support the contract as it is yet mayor. Uh, the mayor praised the vendor and her contract while it was blank regarding fees. Uh, do you have a, a response to that comment as well as there's an issue about whether the pool would be open and shared enough time with the residents as opposed to being privately operated. Yeah, I mean, Bob Welch actually said it best. There's no venture without risk. And we have a risk-averse manager. We have a risk-averse city attorney. That's their job. The city attorney particularly, his job is to advise us of risk. And so can he be secure that there is no risk? Of course he can't. But we have, a, we have an operator who has given lessons to the kids in this community at no charge. She runs a couple of operations at a huge profit. Um, I think the risk is extremely low and the rewards are extremely high. Um, your question was about the time it's open. Um, well, there, it was a two-part question. One was about the, the fees were not disclosed on the contract. And the second one was there's a concern about it only being open two hours a day for residents. Uh, but that's probably details that haven't that been was, worked out yet. You know, there, there's a minimum time that's guaranteed uh, but the operator made it very clear that her intention is to keep the pool open much longer. And in fact, her other operations are kept open much longer as well. So I don't think there's, I mean, every contract has to have a minimum. Uh, but the commission stated very clearly they'd like to see that minimum raised. And the operator said she'd consider it. And I hope to see that again on second reading. Uh, Mr. Rabina, your comment yeah, on this if specific I, if proposal? I may, again, we, we do not want to jeopardize the time that's available to the residents of South Miami. Let's be very clear. That's the main thing. And these kind of deals make me nervous because... The, in order to mm -hmm. now in a desperation mode because it's campaign and they have to commit to these promises, they'll do these kind of things. And guess who's going to get the short end of the deal? The residents of the city of South Miami. I do not want to see that happen. And that is what I'm actually witnessing at this time. Thank you. I will go to an, another question from Hans. Well, 
Well, this seems rather pedestrian right now. I just, uh, I'm going back to parking oh. because the... That's a good one. <laughs> Like I tell you, from a merchant's perspective, this is the most common complaint we get. This is what the most common complaint the Merchants Association gets. It's customers coming in complain about the cost, the lack of, and the enforcement of the parking in South Miami. How would you, gentlemen, if your livelihood depended on keeping that customer that was complained to you about parking, how would you respond to that customer? One minute each, first to Mr. Urbina. Thank you, Hans. Let me tell you, the issue of parking, unfortunately, is a source of revenue. The nice thing would be if we had the luxury of being able to remove all the parking in general, parking meters, let me be clear, because it hurts businesses. And I've learned a lot from Mr. Dover how in other states that has become now mainstream to remove parking meters and making it more friendly. Uh, the deal here is that how can that be done? Very simply. I go back to what they call Government 101, sitting with the merchants, trying to find a way to subs find some other way to subsidize that revenue from somewhere else, not at the cost of the taxpayer's pocket. And you know what may help? If we encourage, they keep using the word smart growth. I'm talking about helping the businesses. And is that if we can help them and there's enough revenue coming from there where the city no longer has to be dependent on those parking meters, that may be your solution. That's about sitting down, working out a plan, and make it happen. It's happening in other states. It can happen in Little South Miami. Uh, Mayor Stoddard, a minute on parking. Well, Mr. Rabina completely understood what Victor Dover was saying. I wasn't talking about removing the meters. That's not what was going on. Uh, but I will tell you, with our new meter system, parking tickets have gone down by one-third. And occasionally I get an irate person coming and contacting me saying, I got a ticket. You know what I do, Hans? I write them a check out of my own checkbook, 18 bucks. And I write an apology letter, and I hope they come back to the city of South Miami. And most people return the check, but they thank me for caring and, uh, and being responsive. Um, as for enforcement, I'm glad we've got good enforcers. But one of the most important things, and I'll come back to this again, is, is the concept of shared parking and a shared parking ordinance. Our parking rules harken back to the 1950s. And there's a wonderful book, and that's the one Victor Dover was talking about, called The High Price of Free Parking, um, in which they talk about pricing parking at the market rate in order to keep spaces open so your customers can get to your shop. Uh, 30 seconds each, because this is clearly an important issue. Uh, 30 seconds additional. Thank you. And, and let, me, and let me agree uh, to disagree at certain times, but uh, here's one where I completely disagree. The new parking machines in downtown South Miami are not friendly. People are totally frustrated with those things. The good old-fashioned meters where you put money in the coin, the old-fashioned was good. There's people, those, half, those machines half the time are not working. People don't know how to program them. They forget to put the number on the side of the sidewalk. What a mess. That is not a very friendly situation. Enforcement, you know what we used to do in the holidays? We used to give free parking to those coming downtown. Those are the kind of programs that we need to start initiating again. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stoddard, additional time on parking? Um, yeah, the best way to park for everybody is park by phone. It's great. You get a text message 10 minutes before your time expires, and you can add more time. Every single space has a number. And as for free parking, I brought it up with the manager, and he pointed out that's why Coral Gables um, you know, Coral Gables is in such bad financial shape. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to a new question from Pastor Rodney James. Uh, I'm sure both of you were here for the earlier question that I'm about to ask again, and I uh, spoke a little more specifically to the African American community. And uh, what I want both of you to give us some initiatives that you have in mind for redeveloping the African, the historically African American community, because it is a hallmark of this community. In fact, the argument can be made that there would be no South Miami without the African American community. What infrastructure, what, what initiatives would you propose to develop that community? And please include what you would do for business, what you would do for housing. Let's start with one minute to Mr. Stoddard. Well, I can start with what we have done, and then we'll go to what we need to do. In terms of housing, we're actually building affordable housing in, in that community right now, um, and it'll be energy-efficient affordable housing. We're working with um, uh, Ann Manning on that. Um, we have a jobs program where people are being put back to work. We have a jobs training program coming in. In the Mobley building, 
We have an incubator for new businesses, and the African-American members of the community are using that extensively. We've even changed the rules on a case-by-case -case basis to allow them to get in there, such as Mr. Rodney Williams and his, and his barbershop. We're allowing him even to expand it. Madison Square has been stuck. I've been trying to unstick it for two years, and we're finally making some progress, but people sure drag their feet around here. Um, Madison Square has an issue. It needs to respect the neighborhood, yet it needs enough height and enough density that it can actually be commercially viable. Um, housing credits are possible on that. It has to be mixed use because all the money goes into, and this is important, all the money available now is for housing. There's no money for commercial development, but the, but the community needs commercial development. And so we need to do it mixed use in order to get them to put that money in on housing and spill it over into commercial. Uh, I, I'm going to uh, allow another 30 seconds and then a minute and a half to Mr. Rubino on this issue. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Would you like to keep going? Or? Well, I'm sorry, you, you no, timed I think, yourself. I, mean, I, I, I rushed it, but I think I, I think I got it in there. Okay. I mean, but it, it, it's very important. Uh, let's hear from Mr. Rubina, and then possibly the pastor will have a follow-up. Thank you. Uh, and, Pastor, I think the question that you need to ask of both of us is, do we support the CRA or not? I'm going to let you know there's people on this commission, and as mayor, I'd like to hear it publicly whether he supports the CRA or not because we need tools uh, because they purposely tell people that that's money that we're losing out on. They don't understand that those are the dollars that we get to keep from the county to do what we need to do, infrastructure and everything else. Um, my, my, my plan is very simple. And when we talk about affordable housing, it can't just be habitat homes. Not everybody wants a habitat home. Not everybody qualifies for a habitat home. We need to look at a larger scale program like we did years ago when we initiated trying to work and create affordable housing. Infrastructure, jobs, what's gone on here, what's happened here in the past two years? Nothing has happened in the CRA area. Nothing has happened to encourage businesses. As a matter of fact, they've made it even difficult for the project across from the post office to even fill in the little spaces. Let's look at what's really happening. Let's ask the real question. Where are you? Uh, Mayor Stoddard, your comment on the CRA funding, and, and there was a question from the audience on comments on CRA land usage. Well, I think that the CRA originally was a boondoggle, but we've been able to use the money well. We do get a significant TIF income from the county, and it's, it's benefiting the CRA in particular and the city as a whole, relieving that part of the tax burden. Um, but when Mr. Rubino was the vice mayor, he had a program plan to tear down uh, South Miami Gardens and rebuild condominiums. That got stopped. Uh, but now the county is actually bypassing the commission. People need to know this. They're bypassing the commission and they've uh, bidded out to Carlisle to do exactly the same thing without our consent. And so the commission's going to have to stand up and address that issue soon. Mr. For Robina. the record, Mr. Robina is not a developer. I never stopped anything. Those were private business deals that went on in the community. And again, that's part of campaigning. I understand. The thing is that here is a mayor who talks about height and density in certain areas. But then again, he was the one working with the Carlisle Group to bring this project in here. And it was going to go way up past the, uh, the height restrictions in the area. So let's be honest, Mr. Mayor. Let's talk about real issues. This is a time where the community needs to really understand the truth. And as far as the CRA, Pastor, I support it because I know the need to have tools to make it happen. This current mayor has said it publicly many times. He does not support the CRA. And it's become a big issue in campaign purposes for the other side of the highway. Fine, one time I've said that. It's, it's public record, but Fine anyway. One time. Okay. We, will, we won't debate. This is more to answer questions. And to finish, remember, I have a motto. My city is only as good as my poorest and weakest link. And that is where South Miami needs to really look at improving. Uh, I'm not saying neglecting time. the rest of the city, but that really is one of my priorities, sir. Uh, Mayor, would you like to comment on his uh, comment about Carlisle? It was in a non-residential area that they were proposing to do that. I mean, the real issue for the city of South Miami is, is whether you do density and height in a residential area or not. There's areas that can take more density and height without causing impacts on residential neighborhoods. But when you go into a residential neighborhood, you have to feather the height down so you don't create a wall and a shadow and block off the air to someone's yard. And, and doing that is always the trick in development. And that's a priority for, um, certainly for the residents. 
and you get additional time. Thank you. Uh, the point is, is that he can explain it in any way. The bottom line, it's very simple. You know, when you say that you stand for one thing, but then you're promoting something else with more density and more height, and you're claiming you're defending the integrity of the community or these, uh, you know, hometown plans and land development codes, that's the thing that goes on here. We're finding out that there's a lot of a uh, lot of things being said, but there's no facts or truth behind it. Let's go and do your research. All I ask people is don't take it from us. Do your research and find out what they're really behind. Okay, they each had uh, two times back and forth on that. So we're going to go to a new question uh, over here to Sean Cruz. Uh, I, I, this one will be very simple. What would you do to encourage investors into either the CRA or downtown or right across from City Hall? What, what initiatives would you put in place you know, to encourage that? One minute each, starting with Mr. Rubina. Thank you. Uh, first thing is making this city a little more user friendly. Uh, it's really tough for anybody to come through here at times. I remember when we left this place, it was a real pleasure and, and it was easy to do business with the city of South Miami. Create the relationship again with Hometown Inc. and the Red Sunset Merchants Associations. But more importantly, market, and I think Hansel was gonna, probably going to ask this question later, is to let people know what happens here by promoting events in South Miami and, and so that people can see we're not Coconut Grove, we're not Pinecrest, we're South Miami and we're unique. But it's creating the relationship that has been lost with the with the business sector of South Miami. Mayor Stoddard. Well, you asked specifically about incentives. Um, and I think one of the most important things that the developers come and talk about is the parking ordinances. I keep coming back to this, but it's what's killing us. Um, we need the right amount of parking. And so, for instance, our ordinances says every residential space needs two parking spaces, no ifs, ands, or buts. That's $30,000 that it's added onto the co cost of a residential unit. If you have elderly, they have one car at most. People in Red Road Commons have 0.8 cars per unit. They don't need two slots. And so we're using up our land and we're running up the costs for the developers and the costs for the owners and renters by requiring the wrong amount of parking. That has to be studied and done correctly in order to promote uh, the kind of development I think you're looking for and the residents are looking for in the city. Uh, Follow-up, Mr. Cruz? No. Oh, okay. 